All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our May 2024 Collaboration Cafe webinar sponsored by the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub with support from the National Science Foundation. My name is John McMullen. I'm the executive director of the Hub, and today we'll be exploring a joint program from NSF and NIH that is focused on data science and smart health. So to help us understand this opportunity, we have two program directors from NIH joining us today, Dr. Dana Wolf-Hughes from the National Cancer Institute and Dr. Yan Li Wong from the National Library of Medicine and the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining today to tell us about this program. Thanks for having us. And we're also very fortunate today to have a prior awardee of the SCH program uh, on the call as well uh, to tell us about her experience developing a proposal. So welcome uh, to Dr. Ana Maria Estrada Gomez from Purdue University as well. Thank you. So the slides from today uh, will be available on our website uh, after the session and our recording will be available on our uh, YouTube channel as well as we normally do. Uh, I will put the link um, to that website uh, in the chat for folks if you'd like to follow up after the session today. Um, and for those on the call who are new to this series, uh, I'll just very quickly mention who we are and what we do. So uh, the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub is part of a national network of four innovation hubs focused on data science uh, that have been funded by NSF since 2015. Um, and all four of the hubs are focused on building communities and collaborations around data science and research data topics. Uh, so if you're watching this from outside our 12 state region in the Midwest, um, feel free to reach out to the hub in your region uh, and get involved in their programming as well. Um, I do wanna mention that um, the four hubs uh, as a program are winding down uh, this calendar year. And so, uh, in fact, today is the last session of this particular webinar series. Uh, and so I wanted to mention a couple of details about that. Um, this has been running uh, since September 21 um, and really was the result of a lot of feedback from our regional data science community about the need for a neutral venue where people from uh, different institutions could meet and talk about potential collaborations around uh, proposal development. Um, and also as a, a sort of place where we could try to help de demystify federal funding uh, a little bit for first time proposers and for early career researchers. Um, so we've had a, a nice run here. This is our 29th session. Um, and we've had uh, success only because of the fantastic guests that we've had along the way. And so I want to call out uh, a, a number of groups here. One is the, the agency program directors who have joined this call and participated uh, uh, as the experts in the programs that we talk about and, and helped us understand uh, the purpose for those programs and, and what the requirements are for those. Um, we have had uh, a lot of really useful information from the prior awardees who have joined as well. And that has really helped, I think, people understand what a successful pro proposal looks like, um, how that may fit into someone's research career, you know, what, what kind of considerations to think about when you're developing a proposal that may have multiple collaborators from different institutions. Uh, and so those contributions have been uh, super valuable to have as well. Um, and then finally, I have been the host of this series for this uh, webinar, but I've, I've been supported by a number of folks on the staff here at the Hub, as well as some co-hosts and uh, guest presenters along the way as well. So really appreciate everyone who has participated, uh, including the audiences. The, the audience really brings a lot of uh, valuable uh, contributions and questions to each of these sessions as well. So. Thanks for everybody who has been involved. Um, we are looking for opportunities to sustain this uh, series going forward. Um, and so if you are interested in contributing to that in some way, we'd be happy to hear about that. Uh, but as of today, this is our last scheduled uh, event in this series. 
uh, but we're going to go out with uh, a really interesting program uh, uh, that is a joint collaboration between NSF and NIH, um, which adds a lot of complexity, I think, but also a lot of opportunity for proposers as well. Um, we'll, we'll hear about um, uh, the solicitation and review process in a moment, which is led by NSF, uh, but NIH also has a separate notice about the program, which has a lot of detail about uh, what kinds of uh, uh, projects are, are of interest to the, the participating institutes at NIH. Um, and so I think it's really important to take a look at that notice, it, in particular, if you're proposing from a a health discipline or a biomedical discipline, um, understanding which institute might be a good fit for that uh, proposal uh, is, is something that you want to spend some time on. And so in the chat, I put the link to the uh, the full solicitation, which is hosted by NSF, uh, but also that NIH notice, uh, which has more details about the, the institute uh, interests. Uh, both of those are linked from the slides here, and so you'll be able to get to those uh, after the, the session, but they're in the chat for you now as well. All right, so I'm going to stop uh, sharing my slides, and we'll switch to uh, Dana's slides in a moment here. Um, welcome, Dana. You're going to talk a little bit about the... Uh, the program details itself, um, and then we will get into uh, some of the uh, underlying strategy that NIH has for this program and, and data science with Dr. Wang uh, after that. So let me go ahead and share um, your slides for you, um, and just uh, let me know when you'd like me to advance those. Sure thing. All right. So, so John's uh, slide before has a lot of great information. Um, you'll notice some of that is repeated on my slides. I, I want to note that while um, there's the link to the NSF solicitation in the notice, when you when you go to that solicitation link for NSF, um, there are if you scroll down on that website. Um, a set of different um, resources and information, including um, previous webinars that we've done about the program, including transcripts for those webinars, which provide way more detail, answer a whole host of questions um, from participants. I think we had over 800 at our last webinar. And so um, I, I do sort of want to encourage you all to take a look at that, um, as well as highlight that these solicitations have one application receipt date per year, and the next one is upcoming on October 3rd um, of this year, which is a little different than last year um, where it was in November. So October 3rd for this year and October 3rd for 2025 as well. Next slide. So this is an intra-agency initiative and it takes a village. And so I just want to highlight um, the leadership team that's involved from both agencies. So on the NSF side, we have Dr. Goli Yamini and Dr. Tom Martin, who serve as the co-leads for NSF. And then at NIH, we have a number of different people who are involved, myself, um, and I am a program director in the risk factor assessment branch within the epidemiology and genomics research program at the National Cancer Institute. And I have been involved with Smart Health, um, co-leading this initiative since 2016. And I've been fortunate enough to have Dr. Yang Li Wang join me from um, the Office of Data Science Strategy since, oh gosh, now Yang Li, what is it, two, three years now that Yang Li has been my co-chair. Um, as well as we get support from a AAAS Science Technology and Policy Fellow who works with me at NCI, Dr. David Zahabi. As well, we have from the Center for Scientific Review, um, Dr. Natalia Komisarova, and so she helps coordinate that shared review that I'll talk about um, during this presentation. Next slide. So 
The goals of the initiative are really focused on transformative, high-risk, high-reward advances in two areas of fundamental science, whether that be computer and information science, engineering, mathematics, statistics, et cetera, in order to address pressing questions in biomedical, behavioral, and public health communities. Um, there is a focus on supporting interdisciplinary teams. And really want to emphasize here that it's important not just to develop an interdisciplinary team just for the sake of creating an interdisciplinary team, but it's really important to have the appropriate expertise in order to develop novel methods um, to answer and optimize um, health and health related questions. So again, they're integrated projects. You have to address two or more um, disciplines address a key health problem, and it's also expected that these proposals include several students and or postdocs. Um, when these are awarded at NIH, um, for those who may be more familiar with the NIH funding structure, they come over as R01s, um, but these are substantially lower in cost than a traditional NIH R01. These are $1.2 million in total costs for up to four years, or roughly 300 thousand per year. So these are really small demonstration projects um, to help set the foundation for that sort of next step, um, whether that be a clinical trial or a randomized control trial. Next slide. So for the current initiative, we have several different research areas that are of focus, and these are outlined in the solicitation. Um, fairness, is one that's a really big area um, of emphasis, not just for NSF, but Yang Li will show in her slides some uh, upcoming um, funding opportunities around this topic. Transformative analytics, um, multimodal sensing, so not just a single sensor collecting sort of accelerometer data, but like what's next generation here? How can we sense multiple different streams in multiple different sensor systems? and integrate those in um, a meaningful and appropriate way. Cyber-physical systems, um, in particular, um, human in the loop or closed loop systems. Um, how can we optimize um, health care delivery or health um, interventions? Clinical image interpretation, um, robotics, and unpacking health disparities and health equity. Um, I want to note, while these are called out as sort of areas in the solicitation, um, by no means is this solicitation limiting. If you have an idea that sort of isn't specifically called out, you can still come in if it falls within smart health. As well, these are not um, mutually exclusive areas, and we see proposals coming in that typically address two to three of these different areas. In particular, an example would be um, an application that is focused on health disparities and health equity. It also has a fairness component and is um, the basis is um, transformative analytics. So that's sort of the, the mesh that we see coming through. Next slide. So the process is a little bit different um, than traditional um, program. These applications um, are submitted directly to NSF. You need to meet the NSF criteria outlined. It does not matter if you're used to writing in the NIH style, that will not work. So we encourage people to really focus on what is in the solicitation. I know John mentioned the notice. Those are areas NIH are interested in as health problems, but those really take a back seat to those fundamental areas of science and meeting the the application requirements of the, of the NSF solicitation. NSF then takes um, the managerial role of review and then NIH participates. So uh, as you saw before, we have Natalia from the Center for Scientific Review. She coordinates that. And so these receive um, both an NSF assessment and an NIH assessment at the same time in the same panel. And then what happens is, is after everything is reviewed, we get scores and for those that are very well scoring, they end up getting percentiled 
um, that information comes to um, NIH and we start the process of making selections on our side. We get first dibs. And then once that selection happens, we notify our NSF colleagues who reach out to individuals like Anna and, and others to say that they're going to come to NIH um, and transfer their application. If that were to happen, um, you would receive an email from Yan Li and I with a bunch of instructions on, on how to do that and what, what's needed. And then it goes through the normal NIH process of getting on a funding plan and ultimately going to council before being awarded. So a little bit different. On the back end, if you're not selected by NIH, then NSF goes through their process and they select um, their proposals um, and it would follow the normal NSF process for award. Next slide. So a big question we get um, with Smart Health is what should or should not come in to Smart Health. Um, so one is that the project is really only focusing on a health area and really not advancing fundamental science or engineering. So what I mean by that is um, basically taking an existing technology and putting it in to address a new health related um, research question. It's nothing new. You're not building anything new in the fundamental sciences. And so that's why we sort of try to say, because these come to NSF, Health is important, but that is sort of secondary to addressing these fundamental science areas. Um, again, proposing an application of an existing fundamental science area to a biomedical domain, as well as focusing on a topic that fits the mission of, a, of another agency. Um, sometimes we get things that come in that really shouldn't be NSF or NIH. They really should go to maybe um, AHRQ, which is Agency for Health Research Quality, um, for example, or should solely be within the realm of NIH. Um, if that is the case, just apply to NIH. Don't come in through Smart Health. Next slide. And I really like to encourage people to get feedback on their proposals early and often. Um, so in particular, we have a um, NSF SCH um, email address that I've listed here. We ask people to send a one-page summary with information including the project, the intellectual merit, and the broader impacts. Um, do not send an NIH-specific AIMS page. Um, again, these are coming to NSF. That is not to say that we at NIH are not interested in um, looking at these or providing you all feedback on your proposals. But because these go to NSF, we encourage everybody to submit to that mailbox. NSF takes the time to go through them and provide feedback, and then they consult with Jan Lee, myself, and others at the NIH Institute Centers and Offices with particular content area to connect you with, and NSF will make that connection to get that specific feedback. Um, and there's also a description of the one-page summary on the NSF website. I will mention, um, again, early, 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 early to get feedback. Please do not start emailing us in September. You are going to be one, I think, Yanli, how many proposals did we have this time? Over 300. You're one of many. Try to get it to us sometime in the summer. It gives you way more time to get feedback from us, um, and you're not going to get lost in that, that inbox. Also, if you don't hear back from either the inbox um, within like a week, um, feel free to ping again. And if you still have an issue, you can always reach out to Jan Lee and I, and we can um, email our, our NSF colleagues. Um, and with that, I, I think now um, we'll pass it to Jan Lee. I think, John, unless you want to take questions now. Yeah, I think let's let's pause for a moment and see if there are any questions from the audience at this point uh, about the details of the solicitation. Um, and while we wait for those to come into the chat or, or people raise their hands uh, to be recognized, 
I'm going to go back to my slides for a minute and ask you about uh, the review process. So you mentioned um, the, how that works in terms of the in the internal flow and uh, the the fact that NSF is managing that. Um, but let's look for a minute at the um, the review criteria um, within the solicitation because I think people may be interested in in how this works um, in. in this program, since it is a joint uh, program with with NIH and NSF, um, so let me go back and share my screen for a moment with you. Uh, this is one of the slides in the the slide deck that that you all will be able to see after the session today. Um, if you're familiar with the NSF review process, you'll see the standard um, uh, two criteria that that they have. Um, but you'll also see um, the specific criteria for this solicitation. Um, uh, from the NSF side, they're interested in what your collaboration and management plan looks like, because this is intended to be a collaborative project um, across uh, disciplines or, or across uh, data science in a, in a specialty area. Um, and so that's important. Uh, but you can also see that there's some NIH review criteria that may be familiar to folks who are uh, more uh, familiar with NIH. And so just wanted to to highlight that for a minute and see, Dana, if you wanted to mention anything about um, how people should be thinking about uh, writing the, the proposal with the eye to having two different agencies uh, looking at this from, from the review criteria side. That, that's a great question. Um, I want to note sort of two things um, here. One is, again, um, these go to NSF. And so always focus on the NSF criteria first, which are the broader impacts of intellectual merit. What we see is that the NIH review criteria sort of matter, but the scores end up aligning very, for the most part, very well between NSF and, and, and the NIH. So if you're gonna score well at NSF, a lot of times you're scoring well on the NIH score as well. Um, two is just to note, that this will be the last um, submission period where these NIH review criteria will be in effect. NIH will be rolling out in January 2025 a simplified review framework. Um, I think there have been notices in that. I can put it in the chat um, a little later. And so the, there will be a simplified framework. And so these will be changing. So if you're looking um, past the October 2024 deadline, um, just note that, that that will be changing as well. And so this is, it's only for this year that these criteria will be in effect. Perfect, thank you for that clarification. Um, I will go ahead and stop sharing uh, my screen again here and I'll get ready to uh, pull up Jan Lee's slides, but are there any other questions that folks have for Dana about the solicitation details before we get into more of the uh, strategy side of things. John, I'll just note the full webinar I mentioned that's on the NSF website mm -hmm. has very detailed information about the specific review criteria at NSF and even information about what to include in the collaboration plan. So I would encourage people to, um, to look at that for more detailed information of what they should be considering. That's great, thank you. And you know, my slide had the list, but in the NSF solicitation, you have more detail on what each of those list items actually means within that review context. And so definitely people wanna read that solicitation uh, in detail to understand what they're being evaluated on as well. All right, so let's switch to Yan Li uh, to help us understand how this particular program fits in to the NIH portfolio of data science uh, activities and uh, maybe some other things that are on the horizon there that you'd like us to know about. This is primarily a data science community uh, that we are addressing through this webinar. We have a lot of uh, folks working in the health space as well, but um, data science is a big area for us and I know it is growing at NIH as well. And so it's great to have you here today to tell us a little about how things are going there and, and where they're headed. Thank you very much, Zhang. So can we move to the next slide? 
Yeah, so I mean, the um, I'm preparing some materials uh, the following the uh, John's suggestion, but this doesn't uh, you know mean to be a very comprehensive I mean, comprehensive description about the the uh, data science activities at NIH because there are so many. Um, so the uh, I'm just uh, you know, pick a few and try to give provide a very quick update. So um, I. Um, I uh, recently joined the Office of uh, Office of Data Science uh, Strategy (ODSS) um, coming uh, came from NLM. So the, the mission of ODSS is to uh, lead and coordinate the uh, data science activities um, uh, uh, across NIH um, towards you know building a modern Modern, modernized, integrated, and fair and biomedical data ecosystem um, to um, the, uh, lead the effort to um, make the resource and outcome from NIH research to comply with the FAIR principle. We know that it you know, stands for the findable, um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So ODSS has been focusing on the five um, area when leading the data science, developing the data science efforts. So that include community engagement, workforce development, development, data ecosystem, and data infrastructure, and tools and analytics. So the uh, next slide, please. The uh, just uh, you know short list of the the um, data science programs areas that um, uh, ODSS has helped to develop. So the uh, the AI and and artificial intelligence and machine learning research. So there um, have been a series of uh, programs uh, uh, program announcement funding opportunities uh, to provide supplement, for example, to improve the, the AI and machine learning readiness of the data generated from NIH uh, funded research. And there are also other programs to address ethic and bias concerns and develop uh, you know, the biomedical repositories and knowledge bases and the um, as well as opportunities for uh, um, uh, data science workforce development. And the, another area is to, um, the, uh, to help to enable researchers to explore and test opportunities to enhance their research project um, by incorporating cloud uh, capability. This is sort of in the area of uh, building uh, the uh, um, strengthen, strengthening data science infrastructure. Um, along with that, you know, the data analytics, uh, the, uh, they're helping in the past uh, four years also, there have been a series of funding opportunities to support uh, the development of open science software tools to improve the quality and sustainability of research software. So, you know, some of these program including this software um, program is being transformed to a longer term uh, funding opportunity. So please stay, stay tuned on uh, the, um, the program announcement may be released uh, in the upcoming uh, months or even weeks. Um, so another area is the aim ahead. So the objective of that program uh, is to establish networks and partnership and to help to increase the participation participation and representation of researchers and communities currently underrepresented in the development of AI and um, um, machine learning models and to enhance the uh, capabilities of the emerging technologies, uh, beginning with uh, uh, utilizing and incorporating electronic health record data. And the, uh, the NIH, you know, NSF Smart Health program that you know, Dana had just described, it's another program that is uh, extensively um, supported by the ODSS leadership. And this year, I think ODS has provided co-founding for many of the uh, applications among the, you know, the 300 applications, as uh, Dana mentioned. So next slide, please. I just want to bring this to your attention that, so I mean, ODSS uh, at NIH, uh, we are uh, working on a special track at the upcoming uh, ISMB uh, conference. And the 
track will be the special track will be uh, held as a one day event on July uh, 13th in Montreal, Canada. So there will be three uh, great sessions focusing on ethics and equity for AI and computational research and sustainable research software and tools in the cloud and beyond. And the third session will be preparing for the future. Um, so um, that will combine the uh, research on AI data readiness and the smart house solutions. So this is meant to convene the awardees from many of the uh, data science programs at ODSS and the NIH, but you are all uh, welcome um, to, uh, to join in uh, if you are traveling to ISMB. So next slide, please. So the um, here is one of the program I uh, know I'm you know uh, currently uh, working on. So let's uh, try to uh, highlight this uh, first. So this is the NIH Biomedical Data Repositories and Knowledge Base Program. There are two funding opportunities here. Um, the two three six is R twenty four and two three seven is U twenty four. So the objective of this, of this program is to uh, modernize NIH funded data resource ecosystem and develop fair data repositories and knowledge bases spanning biological skills and to support compelling uh, data resource at different stages of the development uh, life cycle and to help develop and establish good data management practice. So there is uh, on the um, upcoming uh, pre-application webinar to be held on June 26 and the notice um, is uh, provided here. You can follow that um, to get more details about this um, uh, webinar. And so uh, people need to register. So you're all welcome to come. And next slide, please. So this is another um, uh, funding opportunity that has just been announced about three weeks ago. Um, so to uh, promote data reuse for health research. Uh, the program objective is to um, the, um, encourage the development of a novel in innovative approach uh, for data reuse, including a novel methods of data analysis and to um, as well as develop strategies for leveraging data across different and multiple uh, data resource or data types to drive advancement in uh, biomedical, behavioral, and clinical or health, other health related research. So, uh, as some program details, this is uh, the uh, competitive revision supplement and eligible um, application um, to be eligible to apply, you need to have um, an active R01 or U01 um, NH grant, which has um, two remaining years on the project at the time of application submission. First due date available is uh, June the 3rd this year and budget. So it provides 275,000 uh, direct cost in total, which can be used for up to two years. Uh, so again, you can follow the the, uh, the link of the NOSE and to get additional information or send me email. Uh, next uh, slide, please, John. Thank you. And this is another ongoing uh, program. Um, so the NH Club um, the Lab so it's a 90 day program that uh, uh, enables researchers to explore the cloud at basically no cost and in a secure and NIH approved environment. So uh, participants uh, can receive $500 for Amazon, Google and Microsoft uh, cloud uh, services and will be provided access to uh, uh, curated bioinformatics tutorials and support from NIH technical and bioinformatics expert, experts. So this is open to NIH affiliated researchers, um, including those at institute, institutions eligible for NIH funding. Um, so uh, the uh, there may be some flexibility there. So we would like to encourage 
if you are interested um, to try to apply an open account or help to spread out the word um, yeah, to junior researchers or to students as well. And next slide, please. This is another um, uh, program announcement that just uh, got recently got released and relating to the cloud as well, um, supporting the exploration of cloud in uh, NIH supported research. And the, um, the program um, will allow uh, researchers to explore and test potential opportunities for leveraging cloud uh, solutions to enhance existing NIH activities. Projects already using cloud may apply to explore and test cloud capability, which are not yet leveraged. So this initiative is aligned with the NH strategic plan for infrastructure building and data ecosystem development. Uh, uh, this is another uh, competitive revision supplement. And the, uh, and it provides 200,000 direct costs for one year. Um, it, so to be eligible, you can be a uh, like, uh, active award uh, awardee for um, the uh, one of the uh, funding mechanism listing here. Uh, so the first um, available due date is on June 18th this year. So next slide, please. So the um, this is one of the um, uh, uh, funding opportunity is an R twenty one and encourage and support people to provide uh, secondary conduct secondary data analysis to review scientific insights of the COVID nineteen testing technology. So this program will allow people to utilize the the um, the COVID nineteen data um, deposited in the RedX data hub. Um, so the expiration date of this program is in July. So you have, people have uh, uh, still have time, but not that much to apply. And next slide, please. The, um, so this is just to pass on the information. Um, you can follow the, the link and to um, um, to learn more about this program, but um, uh, in brief, so this is uh, these funding opportunities support collaborative research network, and the uh, so the funding opportunity uh, PR twenty four zero five three is to encourage multi uh, sectoral projects beyond individual health, and the, the next funding opportunity seeks collaboration for technical assistance in community focused projects and application deadline um, is um, the beginning of August. So next slide, please. This is uh, um, the, uh, a project led by uh, NCI and Dana is uh, the co-lead. Uh, so the, uh, the NOSE is developed uh, for validation of uh, digital health and artificial intelligence machine learning tools for improved assessment in biomedical and behavioral research. The, uh, here, so the digital health and uh, um, AI and uh, ML technologies are brought really very broadly to include any health technology, uh, leveraging mobile health, health information technology, wearable devices and sensors, telehealth and telemedicine, also as well as um, the uh, machine learning algorithm and tools to mo monitor and manage health across the life course. And Dana is here to answer uh, the uh, questions. So there are uh, multiple uh, HIC uh, participating in this uh, opportunity. And so the uh, applicants of who people are if people are interested, uh, so I uh, should um, check out the, uh, the announcement to, uh, uh, regarding very specific um, I see a research interest and in requirement. So to uh, in order to develop an uh, application to be responsive in expiration date uh, is uh, July 6 next year 2025. So people have a whole year to yeah, work on that. Um, and next uh, slide. Um, so this is another um, 
a program that led by NCIN with uh, ODSS participation. And the, the, the previous one we just talked about also um, ODSS participate. Um, so this is developed by the uh, NIH Office of uh, Science Policy through a uh, uh, NIH-wide collaboration. And the um, also uh, Dana is a co-lead and the resource uh, presents general points to consider, instructions for use, an optional sample language for the research opportunity. So this resource will be best used to inform research teams and I, um, IRB members who are planning, reviewing, or conducting research um, that studies or use um, digital health technologies. So the, if you have questions, you can send to the email uh, listed here. Uh, you can also um, subscribe to the list to serve and the link is provided here or uh, connect and follow up um, in, in Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. And next slide, please. Um, so this is just the one, the NCI uh, uh, training um, uh, resource that we received recently, so I help try to help to spread spread out the words. But uh, beyond this, there are also many uh, training uh, programs and resources that ODSS is providing. That I mean, considering the time, so I just, uh, I no, not including uh, at this time. But you are all welcome to check out and come to the ODSS website and find them. And so, uh, next slide, I think. It's I thank you so much for having uh, Dana and, and me here. And so my email um, is here if you have questions for those repository or data reuse um, programs. Um, so you are uh, more than welcome to, uh, uh, to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for putting all those resources together for us. Uh, as I said before, we'll have these slides available for people to see on our website uh, after the session. Uh, but you all have been very busy uh, creating these programs, and it's really a, a, a wide range of uh, topics and, and focus areas for people to think about. Um, you know, there's also the the uh, other training programs that that NIH historically has had in in various ways, and and some of those are data science focused as well. So uh, many many opportunities for folks to propose into data science uh, at NIH these days. Um, for our audience, uh, please continue to think about questions for our guests and put those in the chat. Uh, but I would like to turn now to our uh, third guest today, uh, Dr. Estrada Gomez, who uh, received uh, one of these SCH awards, uh, I believe in the last cycle. Um, and so, uh, Ana Maria, tell us a little about your experience uh, developing a proposal for this program. It's you know it's different from what you might see at NSF, uh, if that's a, a typical place that you might write a proposal. I think you're from uh, an engineering uh, background, and so tell us a little about how your uh, your ideas evolved into the health space and, and why this was a good program for you. Sure. So maybe let me start by telling you a little bit what the project is about. Mm -hmm. um, so our main goal was to develop a system to diagnose and treat inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. Um, and so we have kind of three main objectives. Um, the first one is we had a multi-omics data set uh, where we had data for um, healthy people and then people with different types of IBD. Um, and so the question is kind of, can we identify biomarkers for the, for the disease and not only the biomarkers, but how are they interacting and then uh, triggering the disease? Then once we have that, the second objective, uh, and well, I guess I'm in charge of that first kind of data science objective. Um, then the second objective is um, more on the biomedical side of things. So there's another uh, faculty, Dr. Leopold Green here at Purdue, um, and he developed engineered bacteria. 
Um, so the idea is that he'll develop an engineer bacteria that could sense whatever biomarker we identify in the first objective um, so that the bacteria knows that the disease is present. And once it identifies the disease is present, it can release a different biomarker to try to control inflammation in the gut. Um, and then the third objective is, well, okay, we have this engineer bacteria, but how we how do we actually uh, put it in the gut of uh, sick people? And so we have a third collaborator from NCANT. Um, he does uh, additive manufacturing for pharmaceutical applications. So the idea is that he'll create a 3D printed pill where we could encapsulate the bacteria and then the material of the pill would be smart enough to sense the pH of the gut so that when in, it knows that the P, like it's in the gut and the pH is right, it will open uh, the pill and then the bacteria would be released and kind of uh, do what it's supposed to do. Um, so like you can see, it's uh, really interdisciplinary. There's a lot of people from very different uh, backgrounds. Um, and we actually started, so the proposal was due in November, and we started working on it probably January that year. Um, and it started because uh, both uh, Dr. Green and I uh, had recently joined Purdue. And we both had a mentor who said, I think you could collaborate. You should just kind of talk to each other and figure out uh, how you can uh create synergies between the two of you. Um, and he actually had a little bit of uh, seed funding from an ONR grant that he won. Um, and the, the main goal of this uh, ONR grant was to uh, help uh, develop uh, minorities in STEM. So one of the conditions of getting the seed money is you need to work with an HBCU. So that's how we got in touch with uh, Dr. Azad in NCANT. And he said, yeah, sure, I want to work with you. So we started talking in January. OK, how can we all combine our different expertise? And it took us well into the summer just chatting weekly uh, to try to understand each other's even like vocabulary at the beginning, they would talk to me about multiomics data and I had no idea what a metabolite was and what like what it did. So it took really six months to really understand what I was talking about and what they were talking about. Um, and then once we had kind of the problem set up, um, we started kind of the writing uh, process, maybe the beginning of the fall semester. And so we spent from August to November just kind of writing and aligning again all of the aims so that it seems like it's just one thing and not three really different things that we're doing. Uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of a summary of our project and how we got it to the finish line. Great, thank you so much for that. I, I am putting the link in the chat now to the award in the NSF database for folks who would like to see more about that. Um, uh, one thing that that sticks out to me is that we're not only talking about a science and engineering uh, research project here, but you also have some other education elements, right? You have some, uh, some training for graduate students uh, to be involved in the project, uh, but you also have a, a summer camp for uh, seventh to ninth grade students as well, right? So tell us a little bit about how those educational pieces fit into the, the remainder of the project. Right, so I guess even from the seed grant that we got, we understood from the very beginning that we want to attract a lot of minority students to our project and help them grow in STEM. And so that's why the broader impact of uh, the proposal was so important to us. Um, and so we started with, uh, well, maybe we want to start with um, middle school or high school students and tell them how they can pursue a career in engineering and maybe organize a summer camp where they understand how to combine data science or even 
before that what's data science and then how can they use that for biomedical um, applications and we're actually having uh, the summer camp in July this year so we're very excited uh, we already have like all of the activities lined up um, and then after uh, kind of middle school high school we also wanted to touch undergrads and then uh, I had experience working with the SURF program here at Purdue, where uh, we have undergrads doing research over the summer. Uh, so we also wanted to take advantage of the project to show students how they can do research and not necessarily in one uh, siloed area, but rather how to collaborate. Um, and then we have our own grad students that are meeting with us weekly and so they learn about what other grad students are doing in uh, additive manufacturing or developing engineer bacteria and then my student is working on the data analytics part and so they can see how a multidisciplinary project uh, works. That's great. So when they get to the point uh, that you were at, uh, they may know a lot more about uh, metabolites or or whatever the topic is that they are interested in. That's that's fantastic. Um, so our time has gone by very quickly here, but I wanted to to spend a few minutes with you to to see what advice you might have for proposers who are thinking about this um, program but may not have. Uh, an existing collaborator. It sounds like you were sort of in that situation, but you you took the advice uh, of Dana and Yan Li and you started early. Uh, so I'm assuming that would be one one piece of advice. But what else can you tell potential proposers to to be mindful of as they think about developing a proposal? Well, I think just talking to others and just discussing ideas and kind of I I don't know be. Uh, bold enough to actually submit the proposal. I know at some point we sat and we said, should we really submit? Do we, do we really have a chance? And then we said, well, worst thing that can happen, we won't get it, but we should at least try it. Um, and then we got it. So I think definitely sometimes if it's a new project, it might seem like we don't have a chance, but if you actually took the time to plan ahead and think through what the project is, it, just a matter of submitting um, and I would say something that has been really helpful to me um, is uh, serve as a review um, in a review panel I think it's really helpful to uh, be able to read others proposals and then also see like how expert thinks about the proposal and comment on it what are the positive aspects what are the negative aspects that's really useful when you're writing because you already know kind of what's the good and the bad in a proposal. Absolutely. And a lot of times we hear that junior faculty should not be doing uh, work that, that distracts them from their research. But I think reviewing it is a great example of uh, that kind of service where it really benefits you in the long term to understand how that review process works and what you should be thinking about. So. Uh, Dana and Yan Lee, if folks are interested in reviewing for this particular program, is there, uh, you know, NSF has has a, a process for applying if you'd like to review for NSF, but is there a separate process for this program from the NIH side to be able to do that? There is not um, for this program, at least. I will say we send out through the Smart Health listservs, if you all are not a part of that, and I can try and drop that in the link as well, um, a annual sort of survey for people to indicate their interest in serving on Smart Health panels and reviewing for those. Um, but in terms of NIH more broadly, um, that would be a whole separate process. And there's, I think, information on the Center for Scientific Reviews website on how to be a, an NIH specific reviewer. Got it. So we are close to the end of our time today. Would would any of the three of you like to, to leave us with any final thoughts about uh, either this program or uh, Ana Maria, your experience uh, as a proposer and an awardee? No, like I said, just go for it. Um, 
yeah, I think that's the most important advice. Yeah. And you know, you're you're early on in this award. It was awarded uh, very recently, but uh, is it making you think about what comes next? Do you have other uh, thoughts that that this is helping to drive uh, going forward? Well, <laughs> um, being part of this proposal, I learned a lot working with a lot of different people and trying to coordinate everyone. Um, so now I'm actually trying to write my own uh, proposal. I'm working on my career, which is a complete different thing because then it's just you and then you're the only one uh, saying like, yeah, I should do it. I, I would say working with others was helpful because we were kind of motivating each other. So when one would say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't do it, then the other one would say, yeah, we should do it. And kind of we had that balance where we motivated each other. Uh, so doing it solo, I, I'm finding it uh, a little bit more challenging, but still very exciting. Yeah, we have looked at the career program on this webinar a couple times in the past, and we did hear from folks that uh, having someone else who's also proposing uh, that same year is a great way to uh, have a, a buddy who you can chat with and, and stay motivated. And so uh, I encourage you to find someone else to to chat with as well if you don't have someone already yeah. all right well thank you all once again for joining today uh thanks to our guests um we really appreciate you all taking the time and we'll hopefully see some very strong proposals that come through this round and, and we'll see what those look like next time thank you everyone for uh staying with us all right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.